My name is Jeff Teraoka, Jeffrey Teraoka. I am the Chief of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital. And I'm also a clinical associate professor in uh, orthopedics and physical medicine rehabilitation at Stanford University. And I am very happy and honored to be a part of Health for the World. Um, I'm very honored that uh, Bavian Ankor uh, invited me to, for this uh, wonderful project. I think it's very timely and necessary um, that we address the world health issues. I'm actually even more delighted that this involves uh, stroke rehabilitation um, because um, I think it's, it's very high time that rehabilitation becomes uh, um, in, included in world, world, world health concerns. Um, I think as you uh, will see, we can certainly uh, help people uh, with medical and surgical technology. However, we are often left with a significant disability of the survivors. And I think you know, it's only with rehabilitation that we can get our patients um, back to any quality of life whether it be here in the United States or anywhere else in the world. So I'm glad that rehabilitation is now becoming included in all of our health concerns. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about rehabilitation after stroke. And many of the concepts here can be adopted with any type of rehabilitation. But uh, again, I'm going to be focusing on stroke rehabilitation. So the purpose of rehabilitation is to have a patient regain or improve their function. <clears throat> also to help one restore independence. And again, as I said before, improve the quality of life. And then involve the patient in his or her leisure pers pursuits again, as well as vocational concerns, whether it be school or whether it be returning back to a job. And therefore, it's basically reintegrating a person back into home and society. So what we are trying to do in rehabilitation is retrain a person to regain as much function as possible after a major insult to the brain or body. So now notice that I did not say that it guarantees recovery of motor or sensory function. It's still debated whether rehab actually enhances neurologic recovery, but again, it helps, what rehabilitation does is it helps utilize um, the remaining function of the patient and it helps develop correct movement recovery and it, in a sense, uh, facilitates as much recovery as possible as that can be attained at this point in time. So the main objective of rehabilitation is to help a person achieve the highest level of function possible given the extent of disability or impairment he or she has sustained after the stroke. So there are different settings of rehabilitation. <clears throat> uh, one of the most uh, common are, is the acute or comprehensive inpatient hospital rehabilitation, uh, which is what you see in many of the uh, major medical institutions. Uh, we also have skilled nursing or subacute rehabilitation, which is still in an inpatient setting, uh, but it's not as intensive as in acute or comprehensive rehabilitation settings. There is also in-home therapy in which a therapist will come out to the patient's home and uh, conduct therapy there. And there is also outpatient therapy in which the patient <clears throat> is taken to the physical therapy or other therapy um, center and has treatment given to him or her there. There are various uh, rehabilitation services provided, various specialists within the rehabilitation team. <clears throat> so of course, there's the physicians and nurses who take care of the patients uh, um, medically. Um, and there are also the physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists, otherwise known as speech therapists, recreational therapists and neuropsychologists, as well as social workers. There's some other um, um, specialists as well, but these are the main uh, players in the rehabilitation team. 
we as physical medicine, we have doctors oversee the team and um, uh, are in a sense the quarterback which uh, oversees the rehabilitation program of the patient and ensures that everybody is achieving or, or uh, working on the same goals of the patient um, and getting them to uh, as best function as they can within either the hospital setting or the outpatient setting. So let me go over some of the different specialists and what they actually do. <clears throat> so we have the physical therapist, which everybody, which is probably the most uh, well-known therapist. Um, most people know physical therapists as those who help strengthen the patients, uh, get the patient working on muscle strengthening. Um, in, in stroke rehabilitation, however, we call it muscle re-education or neuromuscular re-education. And the reason for that is because if you think about it, in a sense, the muscles themselves have not been affected by the stroke. It's the brain and it's the connections from the brain to the muscles that have been affected. So when we are, quote, strengthening the muscles, we aren't really strengthening the, strength, strengthening the muscles per se. We are facilitating or helping that recovery of the neurologic uh, pathways back to the muscles to get them functioning again and back under the control of the brain. They also work on mobility, which means transfers and gait. So transfers are having the patient um, move from one level or one surface or one level to another level, whether it be uh, lying down to a sitting position or sitting position to a standing position. And then of course they work on ambulation as the picture shows. <clears throat> uh, they are also uh, involved with uh, overseeing the patient's posture, balance and coordination. So if you think about it, if a patient is trying to walk, again, if you look at the picture there, not only is it a matter of getting the person's legs to go uh, one in front of the other, <clears throat> But it's also a matter of the patient attaining proper balance, uh, posture, and coordination in order to put one leg in front of the other, in order to maintain an upright position, in order to maintain balance, um, in, to propel himself forward, and to also be able to coordinate that utilizing the cane or whatever other assistive device that is necessary. Physical therapists also work on range of motion um, and basically to preserve the joint, um, the joint's mobility um, so that the limbs, the extremities, um, and other joints within the body are as, uh, in a sense, supple or um, have as much range as possible to ensure that movements are to the fullest degree as can be. Occupational therapists are probably um, not as well known in terms of what they do. Uh, some people have said occupational therapists keep patients occupied. Well, that's not necessarily true. I guess they do keep them occupied. But occupational therapists focus on the activities of daily living of a patient, that being um, going to the bathroom, um, grooming and hygiene, dressing, uh, eating those kind of things that we do every day that we, in a sense, take for granted. <clears throat> they are also involved in what we call functional activities. So a little, uh, even though they're somewhat daily activities, they're a little more involved than just your basic um, uh, ac daily activities. So that includes housework, uh, cooking, um, paying bills, um, and, and um, even perhaps driving a car. Uh, they also uh, work on cognitive retraining because if you think about it, many of these activities of daily living and functional activities certainly involve a lot of um, having to think and think of what you're doing, uh, having to organize the task, having to, um, in a sense, um, make sure 
that what you're doing uh, is is in se correct sequence, is in correct uh, social behavior, uh, behavioral standards, and um, and it's uh, in, in in a sense in a safe manner done in a safe manner as well. <clears throat> Classically, uh, physical therapists have been thought of working on the lower extremities and occupational therapists work on the upper extremities. That's not necessarily true, but it does seem that occupational therapists do seem to work more on the arms and wrists and, and creating splints and other orthotic devices. Because if you think about it, many of the, many if not most or all of the activities of daily living do involve using the upper extremities. <clears throat> Some occupational therapists work on swallowing um, and uh, as because that's part of your activities of daily living that is eating. Speech pathologists, or again, speech therapists, uh, they like to be known as speech and language pathologists, uh, work on communication skills, whether it be verbal or whether it be written. And the patients, of course, can uh, sustain uh, problems with language and communication, uh, um, similar in a sense uh, with the stroke uh, aphasia, whether it be a motor aphasia or a sensory aphasia. So the speech therapists need to work on them to improve and regain their ability to communicate. <clears throat> Uh, part of this works on co comprehension, whether the patient understands what is being spoken or written, um, as well as memory and verbal skills in um, uh, speaking or writing and cognitive retraining. Again, um, all of what we do in terms of communication we requires uh, cognitive ability. And of course, speech therapists are usually the mainstay in terms of uh, retraining a person to swallow after a stroke. Other uh, team members include the neuropsychologist. Not all rehabilitation teams have a neuropsychologist. However, they are a very essential part of the team in a sense that they evaluate and test cognitive functioning. Again, as I said before, um, many of the uh, activities of daily living and other tasks that we utilize uh, involved mental um, work and, and having to think and having to organize, uh, having to plan and include um, the ability to execute the task as well. So the neuropsychologist will evaluate and test these uh, functions through different uh, tests and, and evaluation processes. They determine the deficits in thinking that may affect function. And some of these include problems with memory, problems with mood, um, which is very common after stroke, executive function, meaning the ability to organize, the ability to um, initiate a task, the ability to sustain a task and maintain uh, attention. And then of course, uh, there's also behavior, whether the pa patient's behavior is appropriate uh, for a social interaction. A neuropsychologists also engage in counseling um, for both the patient and the family, uh, given that there's a significant uh, disability and, and um, trauma sustained from the stroke. Pause. Oh, sorry, not yet. Sorry. Uh, recreational therapy um, is another essential team member. Uh, what the recreational therapist um, uh, does uh, is is actually probably, if not the most important, one of the most important uh, duties within the rehab team. Uh, some people may think of the rehabilitation, uh, the re recreational therapist as uh, someone who takes people um, and plays games with them or plays checkers with them or shuffleboard or something like that. Well, that's not necessarily true. <clears throat> so the recreational therapist does um, uh, take the patient on outings and tries to engage them in their leisure activities, uh, reintegrating them back into the home or community, school, what have you. And basically what the therapist does, what the recreational therapist does is apply 
all the other strategies, all the other techniques, all the things that the patient has learned from the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, um, and apply it to real life situations within the community. And so if you think about it, so this patient is um, bowling, and that's a, quite a feat to accomplish given that this patient is an amputee, could be a stroke, what have you, patients in a wheelchair. Now, it's, it's certainly one thing to be able to bow skillfully from a wheelchair and, and from a uh, disabled uh, um, stance. However, the other th uh, things that you must uh, consider is how does the patient get to the bowling alley? How does the patient um, uh, ask or obtain the equipment to bowl? Like let's say he needs bowling shoes or obtain a bowling ball. How does the patient get down to the bowling lane? How does the patient position him or he or her, herself uh, in the bowling lane? How do they um, take aim? How do they propel the ball forward? Um, how do they score uh, the, the, the bowling game? So all these things come into play uh, and the recreational therapist is the one that oversees all of that. So again, this is the person that basically is key in reintegrating the person back into the home, into the community, uh, back to school and work. Part two. So let me go over a little bit of what happens during uh, a stroke, the initial parts of a stroke, or, or could be even brain injury, any type of brain injury. <clears throat> so initially when a stroke occurs, there's damage to the brain. Um, and there's cell death, there's a lot of uh, chaotic uh, events that happen within that area of the brain. There's ischemia, um, cells die, uh, metabolism is altered and there's a lot of metabolic byproducts and cell products building up in that area and that's called diaschesis so it's the initial reaction of the stroke and that area within the brain is basically in chaos <clears throat> and and some people refer to it as almost like brain shock and so that happens over the initial few days and gradually as um, the circulation in the uh, adjacent area is reestablished, metabolic byproducts and the cellular products are, are taken away, uh, metabolized, uh, what have you. And then recovery starts to occur. <clears throat> and within this process, <clears throat> there is a brain reorganization, a neur neuronal reorganization and plasticity. Now, we classically know that within the central nervous systems, neurons can't regenerate. Um, uh, and, and so with, with that in mind, um, new neuronal cells aren't being reestablished. But what happens is, therefore, those cells, those neurons that have survived need to take over the, um, the duties, in a sense, or the um, tasks of the, of the neurons that have been impacted. And so what happens is there is a... Um, uh, reorganization of the brain um, in reestablishing pathways uh, back to connect, um, connecting with the body. <clears throat> and so in that way, it reestablishes connections um, in a sensory manner as well as a motoric manner. <clears throat> so, so one of the ways of looking at this in, in sort of an, an analogy is that uh, these are uh, telephone connection lines, let's say communication lines within the, the world. So you have the United States and Asia, there's connections to Asia and Europe and South America, uh, India, wherever else. And so <clears throat> in a normal process, these connections are going well. You can call up Asia or you can call up uh, your relatives in India or, or um, Europe, what have you, no problem. But if there is an insult to one of the communication lines and the direct connections are lost, then initially there is all chaos, right? Uh, you can't connect to your uh, relatives. Um, you get frustrated. You call the company and say, what's going on? Um, and so what happens, though, is there needs to be in a, a reestablishment um, of the communication lines through the existing lines that are around. And it may not be a direct connection, 
but it may be um, a step-by-step -step process in, in order to reestablish that uh, connection of between the two parties. So initially, as you can imagine, this initial connection is going to be very faulty, uh, very haphazard, uh, lines are going to be dropped, um, you know, it's going to be very frustrating, but uh, the, the only way to improve upon that is to try and reconnect, is to try and keep working at it and try to reestablish those connections. And with use and with demand and with um, persistence, in a sense, the, con the connection becomes reestablished. And as you keep using that, it becomes more fluid, it becomes more efficient, and then the line of communication between those two centers is reestablished. So that's pretty similar in terms, um, sort of in a simplistic manner, of how the, the neuronal connections get reestablished within the brain after a stroke. <clears throat> So what does this mean, reestablishing pathways and relearning function? <clears throat> so the basis of rehabilitation is relearning functional tasks. Okay, so what does that mean? So when we learn a task, it is an adaptive behavioral change occurring in response to an experience in order to accomplish an objective. So when we are faced, let's say, with having to uh, write our name on the signature line, um, we are presented with a paper that says signature. And so that's, so the response is to be able to pick up a pen and write your, and, and sign your name um, in um, a script or whatever way that you sign uh, your signature. And initially, uh, when you first learn how to do that, you know, you are, you're presented with the paper, you ask questions as to what you need to do, um, you try to uh, sign your name and, and it goes a little off um, at first. And then as you keep signing, it becomes a more established and almost second nature process. So in a sense, that becomes a behavioral change in response to that experience and uh, to accomplish the objective of being able to sign your name. So after a while, when a, a paper is presented to you with a signature line, you know exactly what to do. You, your behavior has changed so that uh, you are able to accomplish signing the, um, the line. All right. And so the brain, that's a very simplistic um, task, of course. But, uh, but the brain reorganizes in response to interactions with the environment. So this is what we call experience. So if we're faced with a certain experience, a certain task, a certain um, activity of daily living after a stroke, the brain must reorganize itself in response to this new um, encounter. And when the person, when the patient is faced with the, uh, the need to, let's say, brush his teeth or his or her teeth, and they have an impaired arm, that person needs to reestablish that task and relearn that task. And so the brain, again, reorganizes in response to those interactions that are presented to it. And with that, there's um, the stimulus for plasticity uh, that is the functional demand or need of the patient. So a patient needs to brush their teeth every day. So that need is presented to that person um, every day. And so that is a stimulus for the person to, um, in a sense, try to become as skilled as possible in reestablishing the ability to brush his or her teeth. That is the stimulus for plasticity and reestablishing the neural connections. In other words, if a patient uh, does not feel the need uh, to do that task, um, eventually that ability to do that task will be lost. So the process of learning tasks um, <clears throat> in rehabilitation uh, starts off with initial learning of the task that requires conscious effort. So when a person has to relearn a certain task, let's say it's walking, or let's say again it's brushing their teeth, initially because they are now uh, faced with an impairment, uh, a weak limb or uh, poor balance or what have you, um, it requires 
conscious effort, step by step, movement by movement, in order to regain that ability to do the task. And that's why the therapist is there to show and to uh, the patient step by step, movement by movement, how to do that. Okay. <clears throat> so not only is there um, the, the need for the uh, motor ability or the muscle ability to um, walk or to brush your teeth, you have to have the coordination of both the motor and the sensory aspects in order to do that. So when a person walks, <clears throat> he or she uh, has to know where their leg is in space, where, where they are striking their foot on the ground, where the position of all their joints are, where their arms and legs, are, where their arms have to be. Likewise, if they're brushing their teeth, they need to be able to pick up the toothbrush, feel the toothbrush in their hand, um, and be able to bring it up to their mouth and feel the, the brush in their mouth and, and feel it um, you know, brushing the teeth. So this coordination has to happen. It's not just a matter of movement. It's a matter of sensory and motor involvement and coordination in order for the task to be successful. And with practice, the task becomes easier. As I said before, that's the reestablishment of the connections. And again, initially, it's very tedious. The therapist has to be there step by step, movement by movement. And the patient has to go over it again and again and again until it becomes second nature. So rehabilitation involves a whole lot of practice, which is repetition over and over. So some of the requirements for learning functional tasks. Oh, we can pause there. <clears throat> That's a lot to go over. <laughs> Okay, part three. <coughs> so we've been talking about uh, reconnections of the brain, reestablishment of neural pathways, and the need for um, initially conscious movement to get the connection at least established, and then repetition and practice to get it polished and fine-tuned and, and, in a sense, second nature again. So some of the requirements for learning functional tasks, as I said before, however, um, it also involves, again, correct movement and technique. Also, the uh, avoidance of maladaptive behavior and the movements. So that's why the therapist is important, because they will ensure that the patient does not adopt um, movement or patterns, as we call it, that will um, Although it may get the job done, eventually it becomes deleterious and uh, it um, causes spasticity or joint destruction or pain. And so the therapist will ensure that the, the movements are correct. If the movements cannot be corrected just by uh, proper movement uh, patterns, then that's when splinting comes in, bracing comes in. But again, what we want to accomplish is to prevent poor habits uh, that will eventually lead to further pain or disability. Uh, one of the other requirements is to use what is preserved, right? So um, if a patient uh, after sustaining a stroke just uses the strong side, then the weak side will never get better, okay? And so, uh, you have to, the, the therapist will instruct the patient to use the impaired side as much as possible, to use what is left in order to preserve that function or in fact, regain and improve upon that function. We'll go over that a little more when I talk about the constraint-induced therapy. Um, one of the other requirements is the ability for the patient to have memory and carry over. So part of learning is the ability to remember what you learned, right? And the ability to carry over what you learned to advance to the next step um, of learning more things, right? 
And so if a patient uh, has impairments in memory, uh, say, for example, in dementia, <clears throat> where they have uh, problems in remembering things from one point in time to another or from one second to the other or from one day to another, then think about it when the therapist um, <clears throat> works with the patient the following day and the patient can't remember what happened the day before, then you're starting at square one again. And so again, the patient has to have the ability to carry over and have memory so that you can build upon the process. And again, as I said before, uh, repetition. Repetition of movement, repetition of the therapy, repetition of the task is all key to improve um, that function. So some other keys to recovery. <clears throat> so the best prognosis in patients is that um, in a sense, function which is preserved at the time of rehabilitation. So, of course, and it's, it's pretty obvious that the more function a patient has uh, preserved at the time of rehabilitation, the better the outcome. If a patient is totally uh, hemiplegic on one side and doesn't have any residual function, then the prognosis, of course, is a lot worse than someone that has at least some ability to move the arms or legs. Um, and again, we can work on that. Um, so again, the best prognosis is the amount of residual function at the time of rehabilitation. Proper and timely therapy, I'll go over that in a little bit in terms of uh, when it is best to institute uh, therapy. <clears throat> Supportive environments, I'll go into that a little more detail. Uh, the ability to learn memory and carryover, I already talked about that. So you remember that, that I talked about that before. See, so you have intact memory. For those of you who don't remember that I said that, well, uh, not so good. No, anyway, um, also uh, keys to recovery, motivation and persistence, as well as acceptance and patience. So <clears throat> recovery of function um, is seen most rapidly after the, during the first three to six months of, um, after the stroke. This is when, if you look at the curve, um, it is uh, very steep in terms of recovery. This is the most chance in which a patient can recover as much function as, as possible. However, after six months, uh, certainly, there is continued improvement, but at a, at a slower uh, uh, pace, a slower rate, um, and recovery can still continue even after that, even past one year. Uh, data is somewhat ambiguous. However, most, if you ask most of rehab doctors, they have certainly seen rehabilitation progress past one year, past two years. Um, I've certainly seen it even past five years. So you can always try and you can always uh, uh, attempt to uh, rehabilitate further. Uh, 50 to 75% of patients regain some ability to walk. Uh, that may be with an assistive device or bracing. Um, uh, and 50 to 60% regain some independent uh, activities of daily living within the six months. <clears throat> Uh, what is classically uh, thought was that is that the lower extremity function is much easier to recover than upper extremity uh, function. So you, you'll see many patients who can walk but uh, have significant disability in their upper extremities. Uh, there's various theories of, uh, of this and perhaps uh, some of it may be related to demand. That is, uh, patients um, uh, feel more inclined to be able to walk um, than um, the ability to use their upper extremities because they have the other extremity to rely on. However, in walking, you pretty much need two um, legs to be able to um, uh, walk easily. Part four, I guess it is. So there are some um, thoughts of facilitators in rehab. That is, what things can we utilize in rehabilitation that will enhance the recovery of um, patients uh, in rehabilitation. <clears throat> so there's no magic bullets. 
Okay, there's a lot of patients who ask, ask us, you know, if I take this medication or if I do the certain therapy, will I be guaranteed to recover uh, my arm function or to um, uh, regain all what I could do before? Well, the answer is no. But there are things that seem to help. And uh, what we have utilized are some medications that seem to facilitate basically learning. So it may not, not directly improve or enhance motor or sensory recovery, but it enhances the ability uh, to learn, to focus, to have, maintain attention, and therefore to sustain uh, their ability to do rehabilitation. And these are the adrenergic agents such as um, <clears throat> The stimulants such as uh, methylphenidate or Ritalin, uh, dextroamphetamines, um, even some of the dopamine agonists such as amantadine. <clears throat> so some of these medications have been utilized and uh, it certainly seems that it helps the patient sustain attention better. Uh, sometimes it can in, even improve their memory and therefore it facilitates learning and again facilitates the rehabilitation um, the ability to maintain the rehabilitation treatments. Uh, there's a theory of uh, constraint-induced um, therapy, and, and this uh, developed in the 1980s in which there was a thought <clears throat> that after a patient um, has a stroke, it's not necessarily that the weak side has been um, uh, affected uh, so severely that they're paralyzed, it is actually that even though it has been, the um, extremity has been um, affected, the person, the patient, um, tends to use the stronger side um, uh, in much more favorably and, and therefore compensates for the uh, impaired uh, extremity. In this uh, process, therefore, what happens is that um, the weaker or the impaired extremity gets weaker, gets uh, in a sense disused, and is in a sense neglected. And so it will never improve. And in that regard, it's kind of like that use it or lose it. So that um, the, the theory is if a patient has the good side or the stronger side restricted or restrained, then it forces them to use the impaired side. And by this, it demands that the um, weaker extremity uh, has to be utilized and therefore, hopefully, can regain strength and movement and function. Um, there have been uh, various varying degrees of success with this. Uh, it does seem that it uh, seems to help as long as there is some function left in the uh, impaired extremity. However, the degree to um, uh, how much it improves is still somewhat questionable. Um, I'll talk about enriched environments, motivation in the mind, and new research in stem therapy that has been going on. Okay. <clears throat> So enriched environments, so there have been studies, uh, psychology studies, in which they have found that uh, animals, um, particularly mice or uh, monkeys, <clears throat> who have been raised in um, environments that uh, were very supportive and nurturing uh, with uh, the trainers there to uh, play with the um, animals and, and nurture the animals with good environments, develop um, larger brains, develop better biochemical structures, um, and actually adapt better to stressors and different harsh uh, or, or challenges uh, to them, as opposed to those who are raised in um, bare cages with minimal food, with minimal involvement or interaction, or with minimal support. Uh, those do not develop very well. And so this, this has been um, adopted to, um, um, in a sense, the rehabilitation uh, field in which um, it seems to help this enriched environment, a supportive environment, helps with recovery after injury. And so what they have uh, shown is that um, patients who have better support, family support, 
um, and uh, a more nurturing environment, such as within a rehabilitation setting, uh, do better than those have been neglected, who have poor family support, who are not uh, involved with any type of rehabilitation um, strategies. And, and you can see this, uh, it's pretty obvious uh, when you see patients and other uh, um, populations who have been neglected, who do not have the, um, the uh, opportunities, do not have the resources, that indeed their outcomes are worse than those that have those resources. Again, what we also see is those patients who have better family support do much better, not just in terms of uh, motor recovery or sensory recovery, but adaptive adaptability to their disability. <clears throat> Which brings up motivation. So patients who are more determined to recover seem to do better. And probably the reason behind this is that if a patient is more determined to get better, they will be engaged more with the rehabilitation process. They'll be more enthusiastic in doing the treatment every day or as frequently as they can. Um, they're more willing to get up and start walking or utilizing their arms or legs um, and start doing the functional tasks again. So determination and persistence certainly make a difference. Um, also, there are theories of the role of the mind and the human will. And again, you know, if you think about it, again, because it probably motivates them to do the exercises, to do the therapy, to do these activities, these functional tasks over and over and as much and as frequently as possible so that they can regain their um, um, as much function as possible. As I already mentioned, the support and nurturing of others helps with the motivation as well. Um, and then there's patients. So certainly you can have a very gung-ho motivated um, patient, but it doesn't help if they beat themselves up and get frustrated with themselves because they can't uh, improve as quickly or to the extent that they want to. And so again, it takes patience um, and encouragement from others as well as the patient, him or herself, that they can try and get better. Because if a patient gets very frustrated uh, dis and discouraged, then basically what it is doing is it's impeding their ability to uh, rehabilitate. So there has been research um, that uh, try, has been um, uh, attempted to improve recovery. Aside from these other facilitating factors, there's now research being done that hopefully can um, assuade many of the effects of a stroke. In the 1990s, there were preliminary studies showing evidence that precursor cells, uh, in a sense, the precursor stem cells, they didn't have stem cells back at that time, but they had precursor cells that may actually enhance recovery of function. Um, and these cells were implanted into the brain, and it did seem to show that some of the patients actually did improve in their function uh, and recovery. In the 2000s, that's when stem cells started coming out, and again, it showed even better promise of potential recovery with cells that were implanted into the brain. Um, there have been preliminary studies now in which magnetic co uh, cortical stimulation um, over the brain uh, may improve rehabilitation recovery as well. And then there have also been uh, interventions such as video gaming and virtual reality, which have been introduced into rehab therapies, which also seem to help uh, improve um, recovery, and that's mainly because it gets the patient more involved with um, fun uh, therapies in a sense. So it's, it's one thing trying to get up and walk and with a therapist in, in the gym in an artificial setting, but it's a lot more fun if you try to um, have a patient uh, play tennis with a video game um, 
and and uh, get them more involved and more relevant and more relevant and functional tasks that they would enjoy. So in summary, the purpose of rehabilitation of the after a stroke is to retrain um, the person to regain as much function as possible. And again, there's no guarantee, but if you don't try, you'll, um, there's no hope of regaining any function. So we try to regain as much function as possible. And in that regard, have the patient, help the patient be as independent as possible, or at least require the least amount of the assistance and avoid bad behaviors or movements in the process. So again, what we are trying to do is have the patient regain as much of a quality of living as possible to enjoy themselves, enjoy their family, uh, be reintegrated back into society, their community, um, and be able to continue their pursuits, whether it be leisure, whether it be school, whether it be a job. Uh, we went over different types of therapies, the physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech and language pathologist, neuropsychologist, recreational therapist, all who have uh, very integral parts of uh, rehabilitation to help the patient get better. We discussed different learning processes and probably the most significant was that the patient has to go through repetition, um, repetitive movements, repetitive therapies um, frequently and constantly in order to regain a uh, function and the ability for the person to remember what they have learned. We discussed different facilitators of recovery, different medications, different theories of therapy, and new and um, upcoming research, especially in terms of stem cell um, implantation to see if that may improve recovery as well. So I want to thank you for uh, listening. Um, I hope this was uh, um, knowledge gaining. And certainly, um, if you uh, want to gain more knowledge, repeat, repeat, repeat. Thank you very much.